real life. Ma'am, unmute. You're still mute. Yeah. So we welcome everyone to this uh, live webinar on the nuances of uh, working with the digital microscope technologies. And we'll be talking basically about the interior segment uh, surgeries. And uh, uh, we'll first introduce the speakers. And I have uh, my co-moderator, uh, Dr. Rajesh Sinha, who is going to be moderating the session with me. And we have an eminent galaxy of speakers with us today to talk on this subject. Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Namta, for initiating this wonderful uh, uh, webinar. Uh, Professor Namta Sharma is the Dynamic Secretary of uh, AIOS. She's also the Regional Secretary of Asia Pacific Academy of Ophthalmology. And she is also the Secretary of iBank Association of India and Chairperson Indian Society of uh, Cornea and Cratter Refractive Surgeons. She has numerous publications, more than 380, 400 publications in various journals. 19 book chapters. She has authored 11 books and has been actively into academics throughout, has received numerous awards, both internationally and nationally. So it, it's really uh, wonderful to have you in this webinar as the moderator. Uh, it is my privilege. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Rajesh Sinha, uh, who is a co-moderator, who is professor of ophthalmology in Konya Lens and Refractive Surgery Services at RP Center. Having completed his uh, MD ophthalmology as well as DNB, he acquired a FRCS degree and FAYACL and has also done a fellowship at University of Washington. He has over 320 publications with three textbooks, four educational manuals to his name. He's the editor of Kerasite, past editor-in-chief of Delhi Journal of Ophthalmology, DOS Times, and lead guest editor for a special issue of Journal of Ophthalmology. He has been a part of three multicentric FDA clinical trials and has presented many scientific papers and instruction courses, both at national and international platforms, and received several awards, uh, including the Achievement Award by the American Academy of Ophthalmology, Asia Pacific Ac Academy of Ophthalmology, SAO Excellence Award by SAC Academy of Ophthalmology, International Ophthalmic Hero Award, uh, Krishna Sohan Singh Trophy for the Best Clinical Talk in DOS, IRSI Gold Medal, a coin Gold Medal, and Bharat Jyoti Award. He is the treasurer of All India Ophthalmological Society, Sark Academy of Ophthalmology. He is the general secretary of Indian Society of Cornea and Keratur Refractive Surgeons and treasurer of I Bank Association of India and past general secretary of the Delhi Ophthalmological Society. We have a galaxy of speakers and the person who's going to be uh, the opener in this series of uh, uh, talks is none other than Dr. S.P.S. Grewal, who is the founder and CEO of Grewal Eye Institute Private Limited, Chandigarh. He completed his MBBS and post-graduation in ophthalmology from Government Medical College, Patiala. Uh, Dr. Grewal has over 35 years of professional practice establishing Grewal Eye Institute as a premium, uh, premier uh, ophthalmic hospital in Chandigarh. He has won numerous awards and recognitions and has more than 150 publications in national and international journals. And he has keen interest in software development and proponent of uh, paperless working and seamless integration of IT in patient care. So it's wonderful to have you, sir, in this webinar. Uh, it is a, a pleasure and a privilege uh, to introduce Professor J.S. Titial. Uh, professor and Head Cornea Cataract Refractive Surgery Services at RP Center for Ophthalmic Sciences, All India Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi. He was awarded the Padma Shri by President of India in 2014. He's also the Chairman of National Eye Bank at RP Center, Ames, New Delhi. He has more than 200 publications in the peer-reviewed journals and has authored two books and 27 chapters in various books, including the uh, very recent book on smile technology. He has to his credit numerous presentations, live surgical demonstrations, instruction courses at international conferences, uh, which include the American Academy of Ophthalmology, the ASCARS, ESCARS, Asia Pacific Academy of Ophthalmology, the APACRS, as well as the All India Ophthalmological Society. He was the first Indian to perform live surgery at the American Society for Cataract and Refractive Surgery uh, 
conference and he has also been honored with the achievement award by the asia pacific academy of ophthalmology in the year 2015 and ao in the year 2009 another very dynamic and excellent speaker uh, uh, who is a part of this webinar is dr shri ganesh who is the chairman and managing director of natal dhama hospital private limited and managing trustee shraddha i uh, i care trust padmanabha nagar bangalore he had his basic medical education in bangalore and then he completed his post graduate training at rio uh, bangalore he completed dnb and then he was observer fellow in peco and lasik at shepherd eye center uh, usa rishri ganesh's main interests are cataract and refractive surgery and he has been of the uh, been in the forefront of latest technologies for peco and refractive surgeries in the field of refractive surgery he is one of the few persons to start smile lasik wave front uh, surgery pekic iols toric icls conductive pleuroplasty etc he has received best fake and refractive surgeon award for the year 2006 from irsi and uh, has given live surgical demonstration for peco and lasik uh, at various places at various conferences and guest lectures in various national and international conferences has many research papers and awards to his credit both international and national uh, uh, it is my pleasure to introduce dr ishtiaq anwar who is cataract refractive and glaucoma surgeon and consultant from bangladesh eye hospital dhaka he did his post graduation from bangladesh college of physicians and surgeons and cataract and refractive surgery fellowship from ila devi cataract and eye oval center in india He further has done his glaucoma fellowship from Arvind Eye Hospital and Institute at Madurai, and has an international fellowship on glaucoma from New York Eye and Ear Infirmary, USA. He served in different capacities in different hospitals, which includes the 500 bedded National Institute of Ophthalmology at Dhaka. And his interests are practice of new technologies in ophthalmology, education, and community outreach programs. He has a special interest in teaching, train, training of peco emulsification. in bangladesh i trust hospital and uh, he he does phaco emulsification surgeries glaucoma surgeries and lasik surgeries routinely but has special interest in managing complex cataract and glaucoma cases and his mission is to provide higher standard eye care with passion we have a young and dynamic uh, speaker in dr narain shetty who is currently head of department of cataract and refractive surgery vice chairman of narayan netrale bangalore He completed his basic medical education at SDMMCH Dharwad, and did his residency from Ramaya Medical College and Hospital Bangalore. MS Ophthalmology at Bangalore again, and cataract and refractive training at Narayan Netral in Bangalore. He has worked under cataract and refractive surgeons of Moran Eye Center USA and SNEC Singapore. He is a very experienced surgeon, both cataract and refractive, and in a very short span of time. he has done more than 13000 cataracts and over 700 refractive surgeries he has presented numerous papers in both international and national conferences and has various uh, publications in peer reviewed journals he has won the best post graduate scientific paper uh, award in the state conference of karnataka and he has won the travel grant award in the international conference of arvo and has uh, uh, for his uh, paper presentation in 2015 He has participated in many live surgical demonstrations in various conferences, and uh, Dr. Narain has keen interest in research. Has been a part of various research projects which are being undertaken in Narayan Nitrale. Thank you, Dr. Narain, for joining this webinar. With this, we request our first speaker, uh, Dr. Greval, to give his talk on digital 3D technology and ophthalmic microscope. Thank you so much, Dr. Namita. Is the screen well visible and is I am yes. audible? Yes. Perfect. Yes. Perfect. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, my sincere thanks to AIOS and Zais for giving me a chance to be with you all today evening to share my experiences with the digital 3D technology as an anterior segment surgeon. now we all know that the the stereoscopy is not something new for the artificial stereoscopy the concept was invented by charles wheatstone 
in 1838, so almost 170, 80 years old thing. And the fundamental principle is to display an object from one angle to the left eye and to display the same object from a slightly different angle to the right eye. And the viewer's brain fuses the two images to create the stereoscopic effect. It is said that seeing is believing. And as an ophthalmologist, we all believe in that, but seeing more is believing more. And since eye surgery is only through the optical feedback, we don't have much of a tactic, tactile feedback for operating. The quality of the image is likely to affect the performance of the surgeon and finally the outcome of the surgery. There are a lot of advantages which will go through the presentation. Uh, it provides a new dimension of viewing experience to the ophthalmic surgeon and the image, digital image processing allows us a greater magnitude magnification without loss of resolution. It also allows enhanced visualization of the periphery up to the aura serrata with good magnification. Does it have a learning curve? Yes, it has a little learning curve. We'll go through the steps as we move forwards, but the increased surgical duration is only for the first few cases. I'll say that from the third, second or third day, you should be back to your same surgical time as you were doing with the optical microscope. Just a brief about the Zeiss RTO-800 system. It's a stereoscopic 3D image on a 55-inch 4K monitor, which provides you a comfortable hazard position. And your, your OR team has a real-time stereoscopic view of the surgery. That means everyone in the OT can have the same view as the surgeon is having. When we are looking through an operating microscope, and that's what we had been doing throughout our life, it is like a tunnel effect. You just see the small area which is operating and most of our field of view is dark. But when you move on to the 3D system, you escape from the tunnel and it's an entirely different perspective right in front of you at a much higher magnification and you stay connected to the surroundings also. One of the big advantages is that you can operate at low illumination. And the, it is possible to operate at low illumination because the sensitivity of the cameras that are used is much more than that of a human eye. Only 20 to 30% of the illumination intensity as compared to 100% in optical microscope needs to be used in this microscope. It makes it more comfortable for the patient, especially under topical anesthesia. And there are less chances of photic retinal damage in surgeries which have a longer duration. The image on the screen has excellent contrast, excellent color and beautiful brilliance. And these are adjustable, but once, once the RT was installed and you have set it once, I don't think you need to change it ever again. Another big advantage is the depth of field. And that is what we are interested. We have all worked on the initial microscopes where you have, we have where, where you initially we, like I started on a Zeiss microscope which had a fixed magnification and a fixed focus and no foot control. And starting from there, we realized that we need a foot switch so that you can keep on moving up and down because the field was limited. But in RTO 800, the depth of field is amazing. You need not struggle with the focusing. Once you focus at the beginning of the surgery, you can complete the entire cataract surgery without requiring to adjust the focus again. And it gives excellent stereopsis. And one beautiful thing about the Artivo is that the stereopsis can be recalibrated as per surgeon stereopsis. Uh, the, the cameras have uh, built-in smile uh, alignment so that you can, when the when the RTO is in, installed, uh, you can get it custom to the kind of the stereopsis you are looking at. Now, this is very interesting. We all know that as the magnification is increased, the field of view reduces and the depth of field also decreases a lot. Now that is one point where RTO really scores because it gives you a combination of big field. It gives you a combination of depth of field along with better stereopsis. Now that is something which you will realize that when you are operating, you are, you are seeing the eye much bigger than what you are used to under the optical microscope. 
you will see that the depth of the field is much better and you don't have to adjust it during the surgery and the stereopsis is excellent. Less esthetopia is another advantage as the surgeon does not accommodate while viewing through the eyepieces for a long time as 3D system does not require near vision. It does not need the eyepieces to be adjusted for that. And the ease of the working at high magnification is really great. And even if the, even if the microscope setting says 8X or 10X or 12X or 16X, uh, operating at the same microscope magnification through the optical system versus on to the digital 3D monitor, again, is a different experience because you get much more relative magnification as you are operating. You can see there's those fibrils, fibrils dancing at the posterior capsule. And these kind of a magnification and detail, I had never experienced with the optical microscope. And this is the magnification at which, which you can go. You can work on that magnification. And it is so interesting to realize that the, the tips of the instruments appear so different under the RTO. This is the sandblasted tip of a biomanual IA, which I never realized that it has a surface like, like this until I started using the RTO. Uh, is there any lag? Because theoretically, you have a camera capturing the image. The, the, the image of the operating eye is not coming directly to your eyes. It's going to the camera. From the camera, it is going to the computer. From the computer, it is being processed. Then it is being displayed onto the monitor, and then it is coming to you. So one may feel that there may be a little lag when you are operating going through this additional system, but there is actually no lag in the display. There is a little lag in the illumination compensation. That is, if the illumination changes, then the system takes a little time to adjust to it. Does it make any difference in the cataract surgery? No, because during our cataract surgery, our field, our magnification, our illumination remains constant throughout the surgery. So it doesn't make any difference of, of this lag in illumination, except in some situations where you have a very highly reflective instrument coming into the field, which gives a greater light. And you may feel the background becoming a little darker for a short time. Changing field illumination sometimes poses issues in retinal surgery, especially when you are working in the periphery. So RTO leads to a complete change in the perspective in which, in the way which you are operating. Now in the learning curve, is there any recalibration of the coordination required? The truth is no, because as an ophthalmologist, we are already using an optical microscope. We are looking like this and operating with our hand down. So this way, there is already our eye hand coordination is already dissociated. So we are looking somewhere else and we are operating somewhere else. So there is already a dissociation between our eye hand coordination. So it comes quite handy when you are using RTO because all the adjustment that you need to do is here move your head a little to the side so that you are looking at the monitor which is placed right aligned to close to the operating microscope. This is the only change that you need to do when you're moving from an optical to a 3D system. So a short learning curve is achieved ability to direct instrument to incision without looking down at the eye. So this, this also will take two or three cases. Within two to three cases, you will be looking at the monitor. You'll be holding the instrument from the assistant, and you will be able to direct the instruments right into the eye without looking where the eye is. So that step didn't take much of a time to learn. Another big advantage is ergonomic advantages. Um, we all know that uh, operating, the surgeons have a higher incidence of their spine problems, backache problems, neck problems, and uh, upper extremity symptoms. And they are seen in almost up to half of the surgeons operating over a number of years. And this is because we have the patient, patient side, operating table and the operating microscope, and we have to look through the binoculars, we are forced to adjust our position and bend forwards to look through the microscope. With the, with the RTO, you are sitting back, you are, your head is completely dissociated from the operating microscope. You have a superior back and neck comfort. It's easier to keep your back straight as you can move your head away from the eyepieces and you don't have to lean forward for this. 
uh, it is an aggregate of small small things which make the final impact when you before surgery when you are going to start the surgery you are just the stool height you look at the foot switches are they comfortable or not you look at your patient's eye position and you have to adjust your head also to the operating microscope now this becomes a little issue if somehow we could take one component which artivo takes out then it completely dissociates your all these things and you can have a position which is comfortable and your straight back and it is a hybrid mode like like in beginning if you i didn't have that issue at any stage to shift from the 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 digital to the optical mode uh, right from my first case i have been doing all the cases on to the 3d only but it has a optical mode there is a small switch you just flip the switch and it changes from the digital to the optical microscope now i i think that is a huge advantage if there is some something is there or some situation where you, you want to go to the optical it is just at the flip of a knob that you can go through another advantage of this system is is if there are multiple surgeons operating in the same room which is always there in the organizations there is no need for ipd setting otherwise every time you sit on a on a optical microscope you will adjust your ipd then you will adjust the refractive error to your thing you will adjust the eye pieces for refractive error uh, if you are wearing glasses you will go to the high eye point setting on the eye pieces by screwing them out and there is no need to adjust the inclination of the binocular so so a shifting between the surgeons is seamless kind of a thing with nobody has to make any adjustment for the for that and that becomes uh, uh, excellent in the training also because when you are training the resident there will be many situations where trainer may have to intervene and the the trainee has to get out of the so get out of the stool and surgeon has to take over now in that situation the switch over is so quick because the surgeon is already viewing the same view he has to just sit on the stool and continue with the the steps of the surgery the training is not limited to one resident at a time so if you have 10 residents at in the ot each one is getting trained at that time and it is far more comfortable for the assistant enabling them to pay better attention to the surgical step it's very important in in um, in with as assistant if you are assisting in vitrectomy you have to bring down the lenses in position so it becomes very easy for the assistant to get the things quickly and accurately and precise in focus for the surgeon and advantage of a uh, stereoscopic videos to improve the understanding of the surgical steps and enhance the learning of the new residents uh, there is excellence of reviewing of the surgeries because stereoscopic view improves understanding of instrument handling for the residents uh, we found that uh, after moving on to artivo the incidence of complications by the trainees has come down and these trainees are who have done just three four cataract surgeries before they come to us we are we are party to the we are part of the resident training program for northwestern university so it definitely has has a tremendous effect on the training and these are the reasons which i have already mentioned uh, this is we went through our data because we have the actual surgical time data for all the cases for many years and we found no statically significant difference in cases operated on artivo or operated earlier on the digital microscope uh, this has the few views from the ot this is this is the res, this is the trainee operating again it's very comfortable they don't take much time to to move on to the system you stay connected to the surroundings uh, this is a trigem surgery this is how it is recorded the stereo surgery is actually recorded like this and when you display it on the 3d system the 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 monitor combines these two images into a 3d image and it does have uh, this we is the have view from one of our consultant dr mansi rtv view surgical visualization system at our institute for the past few months now uh, what i would say is the learning curve is quite short and we were able to adapt after just a few cases on the machine in terms of average duration of the surgery it didn't differ significantly from that performed on the standard operating microscope and had minimal intraoperative complication 
owing to the excellent depth perception, um, better screen parameter control, wherein one can change color, contrast, brightness, uh, gain and hue, and even regulate the white balance, which helps enhance the surgical performance. The surgeon also to maintain a comfortable, stable position and carry out surgical prolonged procedures, uh, reducing the musculoskeletal fatigue and strain, which may have compounding effect over the years and certainly improved ergonomics. And it also helps as an improved tool for teaching of intraoperative surgical procedures. Your assistant can also see better, hence um, assist better. And overall, it's an evolving technology that is relatively easy to shift on to, and you can manage most of your uh, vitroretinal procedures using this. Uh, so there are additional digital operating tools, which is the cloud system and uh, the the use for the use of the toric, the Callisto on this is a much better and more accurate system than our experience with the with the older system. And I'll not be going in detail because we have a talk on this later on in the session today. Uh, so improvement over the time. Are there some things which I would like to I would wish to have in it in the future? Uh, better and faster auto iris control improved software calibration for the for the images maybe built in thermal cameras maybe fluid flow highlights uh, maybe posterior capsule analysis or maybe intraoperative warnings using ai or a dye free capsular staining by using different wavelength of light so there, there's a lot of potential and the directions in which uh, our surgery may change over a period of time once some of these things are taken up by zeiss if you are going in for the RTO 800, are there any changes that you need to make in the OT or anything you to be need to aware of? Yes, you have to modify the OT setup. And the main difference is that you need to make a space to put that 55 inch monitor trolley. Uh, you need to upgrade your recording system and storage solution because the 4K stereo 4K recording takes a huge speed use space so do you need to have a faster system of uh, downloading the files and a fast and a huge space to store all your surgeries and you need prescription 3d glasses if you are a myop so that that is again something very important that when you order rto please get your prescription 3d glasses training of the ot staff is not much of an issue uh, involvement of the ot staff definitely improves uh, the assistant is really much in a much better position to help you out in the surgery. All, all can see what you see. That, that's another thing. And the best is you don't feel that you are operating. I had been using, uh, because of my backache problem, I had been using a belt during surgery for all the years, but within two months after changing to Artivo, now that is just hanging in the, uh, in, the dog, in the changing room in the OT. I haven't used it now for almost a year and a half or two years. So the days of only the surgeon enjoying the surgery in the OT are over. Everybody is enjoying now the surgeries. And one confession at the end before I finish my talk, I'm very possessive of two things in my life. First is my Porsche Carrera 911 and my RTO 800, both ultimate player. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir, uh, for that uh, fantastic talk on uh, RTView, which, uh, you know, covered uh, almost everything. And I'm sure there are going to be questions, and I think we'll take the first set of questions up after the next talk. I would now invite Professor J.S. Tital, uh, who's uh, going to be giving his uh, views on the uh, digital operating microscope. Yeah, good evening, friends. Namata and uh, is visible? Yes, sir. Perfect. Yeah. First of all, I'd like to uh, thank uh, AIOS team uh, and the uh, JAIS people for organizing this uh, uh, wonderful uh, session on uh, digital technologies. I think entire uh, surgery, not only the ophthalmic surgery, most surgery done in the body has become digitalized. And we are not far behind in uh, improving the outcomes of uh, various ophthalmic surgeries with digitization. 
So I'm going to talk about uh, the workflow of cataract surgery with uh, new digital technologies which we have with us. As far as uh, uh, financial disclosures are concerned, uh, I have no financial disclosure to be made. Uh, we have been employed by the government sector, All India Institute of Medical Sciences. Let me uh, take you through this uh, presentation in three segments. So if you look into workflow for cataract surgery, there'll be three things. One is the pre-operative assessment of uh, our cases. And what about interoperative uh, features with uh, digital systems? And ultimately, the post-op assessment for looking for outcome satisfaction of our patient after uh, doing surgery. So let me take you the first thing, which is basically the work of a patient, which is now become so accurate with optical biometries and the abrometry analysis of these patients. Then most importantly, the data transfer of these uh, diagnostic to the operating microscope for uh, your surgical enhancement. So effectively, we can say today the cataract surgery has become like a refractive surgery it's mainly because of availability of these technologies, which made things possible for us to calculate in a manner which will give you ultimate results. So this is how I'm going to take you through the initial things, which will be basically looking for IOL Master 700, ray tracing of cataract patients to get abrometry of the eyes, and how to get the data transferred to have a surgical precision and accuracy in the operating table and the final outcome in a post op period. IL Master 700, we all know, is the uh, latest uh, technology in optical biometry, which gives a telecentric keratometry to give you a better assessment of a corneal, a corneal as such. And the attachment of swept source OCT, which provides the uh, total K, which also encompasses the both anterior and posterior corneal curvatures. We all know posterior corneal surface has become very important since we have been uh, working on a toric eye uh, outcomes. Now we know that posterior corneal surface has to be assessed to achieve a good outcome in a toric eye implantations. Once we have a, a surface OCT attached in IL Master 700 that effectively uh, calculates the entire uh, both anterior and posterior surface, gives you a total characterometry which is basically uh, takes away the uh, calculation which we have made initially to presume how much will be the effect of a posterior corneal curvature in ultimate IL power calculation. So that's the advantage of having combination of uh, IL master, which has telecentric three zone characteristic uh, assessment of ant anterior cornea with the OCT, you get a nice posterior uh, surface assessment of these cases. And TK will give you a better assessment for, especially for IELTS power calculation, which are looking for uh, uh, cases with toric IELTS. And especially now with the trifocal toric lens, so you require a very accurate assessment. And most importantly, the post refractive surgery patients, where we do have major challenge of uh, assessing the corneal toracity or corneal power more accurately, because after refractive surgery, both anterior and posterior corneal curvature would change. And the tools which we had earlier may not give you a true analysis of posterior curvature change after refractive surgery in these corneas. So this uh, IL Master 700 uh, gives you a, a true K or a total K, which will give us a good assessment of IL power calculation in uh, cases of post-refractive surgery patients. So if you have IL Master 700 as an interface, what all things is can be uh, used to uh, get a good uh, outcome in your patient. So basically it, it is the integration of pre-operative assessment with uh, IL Master 700 and transport this data to the operating table. So basically it is an ethernet port which is connected, uh, internet connected with the system to the printer and the software can also be there. The data interface is electronically, it can be transferred to your operating uh, system, especially microscope, where it can be computed to assess your Callisto eye. So the toric eye alignment can be easy. So either it can be transported by your USB port or you can have a forum attachment where you don't require to take any uh, data with USB. That, is, that makes the surgical area much simpler. Your workflow can be much, much, simpler and no uh, disparity. Sometimes you can have multiple uh, image, uh, data in one uh, 
system and that can confuse sometimes your toric or calculation also. So I would say if you have a forum, that makes things better in terms of managing your workflow in the OR. The second important thing, digitization of a pre-op worker would be assessing the abrometry, especially looking for a angle alpha or angle kappa. Angle alpha will be much more important for a IOL implantation, both for a toric as well as for a multifocal or trifocal lenses. So if you have patients with a high angle alpha, which is more than 0.5 millimeter, so these cases may be a poor cases of for a premium IOL. So this will sort out the patients which can have a post-op uh, poor vision, especially they can have uh, visual symptoms like halos and uh, glare and uh, star breast. So that can be avoided in these patients. So this has become an important assessment preoperatively for all patients nowadays. The second important part of a workflow would be after you've done a good assessment of your patients uh, clinically in a pre-op section, the data has to be transferred into an operating microscope. So what all things we can do there? So we have image guided systems attached like Callisto in a JIS uh, 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 system, or you can have attachment of integrated intraoperative OCT, which can give you a true dynamicity of changes happening during your surgery. It can also give you sections of uh, your structure so you can know what morphological changes you are seeing in your patients, especially if you are doing a cornea or retina surgeries. It is also useful for cataract surgery also. You can have intraoperative abrometry based calculation of a, a IOL power or a toricity or a toric alignments. And what uh, uh, we just heard the previous talk on a, the digital microscope, especially 3D heads up surgery, which can also improve, improve your outcomes to have a good post-op picture in these cases. So I will take you through the important area of cataract surgery, that is toric IOL implantation. We all are doing toric implantation for our patients because we know that anything more than one diopter cylinder in the cornea can cause a post-op poor unaided vision in your patient. And that can be a headache for a patient and for a surgeon also to explain why vision is not 6-6 without glasses. The toric eye will uh, significance is there because we always have around 30 to 40% of patients will have at least more than one diopter cylinder, especially if you have a multifocal or a trifocal cases, this toricity less than one diopter also it should be corrected with toric eye -wells. So basically we have been taught that we are going to see the astigmatic axis of patient in pre -op factor, the amount of astigmatism is uh, with the rule against the rule has to be seen. And on the table, you have to mark the axis, both the reference and implantation axis accurately if you are using manual. But if you are using a, a alignment with a system, which can give you a image guided surgeries like Callisto I uh, G, G align or a Varion. Uh, these are two important system we have nowadays in OR, which can help you. Or you can have an intraoperative abrogatory devices. We can also enhance the outcome for your patients. So classically, we have been doing a three-step procedure that uh, is going to give, as I said, uh, two, uh, three reference marker, then uh, intraoperatively access marking for these patients. And image-guided modalities now we have. So if you see the various uh, results analyzed in the literature, they would say visual acuity is always comparable with the various types of uh, devices used for uh, marking the cornea, and even with the image-guided systems also. But if you look at the visual quality, which is the actual assessment of uh, outcome of uh, these lenses, is not uh, well known for uh, most of these uh, cases with various devices. So these are various devices used for image guidance systems. You have Osher's eye trace system can be used. As I said, Varion and Callista are the one which are using very regularly, and most people are using these devices. You can have Aura or OptiWave refractive analysis by Alcon, which is a based on an intraoperative uh, uh, wavefront refraction to calculate the power and uh, see the alignment also. Just to show you one of the tricks we play in the operation theater, this is a patient under Artibo. So image guided system will give you an accurate uh, incision placement for a, a main as well as uh, for side port. And that is important because sometimes SIA would change if you change your incision, never change your incision as per the axis, maintain the same axis for a toric IOLs because the toricity is going to be corrected by IOLs, not by your incision. 
This also helps you giving a good cash flow exercise and centration. And that will be effective for a placing lens effectively in a proper position. So once we complete the uh, nucleotomy safely, you can have uh, cortex aspirated. You all know for any IVL uh, implantation, proper uh, cleaning of posterior capsule also important. Viscoelastic has to be removed effectively both from anterior to the lens and from the posterior to the lens surface also because the rotation post-op can be mainly sometimes because of a retained viscoelastic. So these three marks which you see with the jet aligned uh, calisthenic system is uh, the central one has to be aligned to the three dots which are there in an optic haptic junction eyewear. Always keep the lens little away from the central area, anti-clockwise, hydrate the wound, make the chamber stable, then just tuck the th these uh, the lens to get these three dots in the lens to align with the center line of a callisto uh, images. You can have, you can see nicely centered images with the line. So this will effectively improve the outcome for your patients. But sometimes these lenses, especially jail, uh, open loop L-shaped haptics are difficult to rotate anti-clockwise. So you have to make sure lens is well open. I can see that my axis is 111 degree here, well aligned, I'm hydrating the wound area. So sometimes during this procedure also lens can move. So it's, it's gone away from my area. So I can't rotate reverse. I have to rotate entirely 180 degrees to come back to the area. I leave it a little anti-clockwise, then subsequently place the lens in a, after making a complete watertight closure of your chamber. To make sure you remove entire viscoelastic, maintain the anti-chamber integrity, then tap the lens in a position from the anti-clockwise to clockwise. So this is what I want to show people that manual marking can be haywire sometimes. It is almost five degree away from the desired axis. So I'm putting uh, my own way to correct uh, the orientation here. The marking has to be sharp and as clean as possible. If you have a wider mark, that can also take away your uh, one or two degrees. So this is a sharp marking here, which is matching with the callisto marking here. Now after surgery also, you'll see manual marking and the callisto marking is also matching. So if you want to use only manual marking, you don't have image guidance system, you can still achieve a good results, but you have to have a consistent marking by an experienced person in a patient. And especially if you have a three reference marking that will give you a much better alignment and may take with a torsional effect also. This is our initial uh, uh, result of comparing manual versus uh, image guided surgeries. And we found that uh, image guided surgeries would be uh, definitely better. So this was a uh, group one manual marking and group two cholesterol marking and had a significantly better relation of uh, post-op assessment with eye trace. Looking that in image guided system, we had lesser deviation from the main axis in these patients. And the other important thing was visual acuity were comparable, as I said in the beginning also. But once we looked into a, a modulation transfer factor, function, which is basically the contrast of these patients and point sweat function. Both were effectively much better in case of the image guided surgeries. That shows that if you are nearer to the, your reference axis or implantation, your quality of vision of patient will be much better. This is a, a device which is uh, attached to a femtosecond laser. And uh, you can see here, this device gives you a little knob in the capsulotomy, and that can be a reference axis or implantation. The laser devices can also give you an enhancement of a placing eye well in accurate access for these patients. This is one of our patient uh, which is correctly aligned to the tongue which is there in a refractive uh, capsulotomy and eye well can be implanted subsequently. Comparing Callisto versus Aura and uh, there are many reports out there. Callisto and Aura e are equally good but some studies uh, would say Callisto will be better in some cases also. What about uh, workflow with the Artipo 800 uh, 3D operating microscope? We heard Dr. Garewal uh, taking us through the entire system. This is also is uh, a significant increase in the safety of yourself, patient, and getting a good results. This is our uh, editorial we published in IGO, looking into uh, its advantage in a current uh, normal of working in a COVID time. We do have three beam system, active or passive. What we use is a passive uh, 3D system where we use a heads up system. We have two uh, available in India, Ingenuity and Artigo uh, cases. 
So this is what uh, Dr. Garewal talked about. You can go to very, very high magnification of these patients. My illumination around 36%. You can see 17.5 uh, time magnification. And despite this magnification, the image is, doesn't get distorted. Only thing, the movement of eye of patient can be magnified also. So you have to be careful little in these cases. So this is very, very advantageous. If you have a complication like PCR, uh, you can see better and you can manage better in these cases. Second advantage is it also has cholesterol aligned uh, attachment. So after IOL implantation, especially for a multifocal, trifocal toric lenses, the alignment can be better done in these patients effectively because you have a larger screen to see and you can do better. Third is had an OCT attachment and uh, difficult cases like a white cataract. You know that what type of white cataract you are dealing with. You can uh, assess the intraoperatively what type of uh, fluid release you have, how much is the pressure release after your initial lick, all can be assessed with uh, your IOCT attachment. The most important thing which I have seen is the patient which Dr. Garewal talked about, the illumination in a topical anesthesia, patient may not be comfortable at all. You can see if I decrease my illumination, I can go even up to 5% illumination to make a uh, patient uh, see better. You can see I'm going down now, working with a 5% illumination, patient now fixes and you can do a surgery comfortably. So that's the advantage of uh, this uh, system with this microscope. If you look into a cholesterol system because it is magnified, so you can see these three lines of cholesterol, which is, uh, you can say, minified in uh, your screen. So this will also improve your precision in a implantation of toric aisle because the lines are narrower, your uh, alignment will be much better in these cases. To compare Ingenuity with Artipo, Artipo is a integrated system which has a lesser lag than a Ingenuity. Therefore, it is a better system for anti-segment surgeries, though both are equally good for post-segment surgery also. As I said, for a COVID time, the surgeon is also away from the patient's eye and the residents can also sit at least you know, two meters behind and they can effectively see the entire surgery without uh, creating a crowd in the operation theater. So that's a very good system in a COVID time also. And uh, it's a unique in terms of economics which Dr. Garewal talked about. You are absolutely stayed viewing the system, but a little bit angle from head to eye. This you get used to within a few surgeries. The only problem maybe is the assistant can have a larger angle for uh, adjusting. And sometimes uh, uh, the sisters can have a little difficulty if you put the lights off. What about digital workflow in a post-op period? That is basically by looking of uh, ray tracing abrometry, toric enhancement softwares, which can also improve your uh, quality of uh, your assessment of post-op cases, especially with toric IOS. So this is what we use, eye trace, to look into your patients. Like this patient would require a rotation of 74 uh, degrees, which will improve your cylinder effectively for, to a 3.14 diopter. So these type of things doesn't happen. This is a rare case which can happen with a rotation, a high myopic patient with a back is large. So these cases we have to reassess, then subsequently rotate these cases. <coughs> this is another patient, so 25 degree rotation. The patient has a good uh, visual acuity, 2025. 20, and so that if you rotate, only 0.5 correction will be there. So you have to take a decision on this. <coughs> Sorry. This is one patient, effectively no rotation required, one degree. And this is a software which is available with, you know, uh, www.astigmatismfix.com. You can analyze it similarly in these cases also. <coughs> to summarize, uh, Toric I will, the prerequisite for a, <coughs> in the digital time also is uh, manual methods may not be good, but uh, pendular methods are <clears throat> equally good. Image guided systems have really given a way for uh, accuracy of our, our patients. Intraop abrometry may help in uh, some cases, especially post refractive surgery cases. 3D head swab uh, display is helpful for surgeons. <coughs> Sorry. With the enhanced uh, ergonomics, especially the magnification, working with the uh, OCT and uh, Toric uh, no, image guided systems does help you in improving visual quality. Residents, I think, as Dr. Garewal talked about, it's very helpful for teaching. A large number of people can see at a single time. 
and they can assess themselves uh, seeing the surgeon and improve their surgery also. So institution where we have more teaching, these devices are seem to be a must in future. For nursing staffs also, they can see the surgery and what is being going on and they can assess better. But sometimes with the lights are dim, they can have difficulty in, uh, especially they're loading the IOLs. Digital outflow uh, improves the workflow for our patients, both intraoperative, where we have advanced diagnostic like IL Master 700, which gives you a, a formula which can effectively be used for a, uh, difficult cases like post-refractive surgery patients, ray tracing abdometry. Interoperatively, uh, they can be integrated to an image guided system, IOCT and abdometry. And basically the entire pre and uh, intraop can be integrated by seamless transmission through forum. And post-op uh, assessment is also digitalized nowadays to get a good results uh, for our patients. Thank you for a kind listening. Thank you so much, sir, uh, for that comprehensive uh, digitization of the uh, entire cataract uh, flow. And I think that is going to be the future. Uh, I would now request Dr. Shri Ganesh to give his talk. And his talk is going to be on RTV 800, interesting surgical videos. There is a question uh, both for Dr. Grewal and Dr. Tityal, sir. And I think sir did answer this in his talk, and that is uh, that there is some amount of tilt which happens because when you are specially operating temporarily and if you are not doing it uh, superiorly, then there is a tilt which happens and there is an angle which is present between the uh, between actually the monitor where you have placed as well as between your neck. So how do you compensate for that and do you get used to it? Hey, as uh, uh, both uh, me and Dr. Karewal talked about, uh, definitely there will be a, some tilt in terms of your vision is concerned. But your uh, body position is absolutely straight. So what I have measured, it ranges from uh, around 7 to 10 degrees uh, from the, the axis you have for uh, microscope with the patient's eye. So that is compensated by, you know, uh, your hands are actually in the patient's eye state. That we are always, uh, you know, we are potentially being trained into being a uh, straight to the patient's uh, position. Your hands are absolutely straight to the patient's eye. It's only your eyes are which is little away to the screen. So that you get used to. Only problem which I have faced now, like since we have this system, I have only done surgery in uh, head serve. Once you go back to the operating microscope, everything looks very, very small. It's like uh, shifting from a naked eye to a microscope surgery. Microscope gave so much of magnification and better visibility. Same thing now, shifting to Artivo head serve device, it gives us so much of clarity. The magnification, once you shift to microscope, everything looks very dull. So that also people have to uh, get used to. I think that that is what I wanted to point out also when Dr. Grewal sir was you know, talking that it's okay to teach residents. It's okay to make them learn on this. It's okay to make them do the surgeries, but what will happen when they go out from our setups and, uh, you know, open up their own practices and suddenly find the whole world so minified. So <laughs> that is a problem with us. We are just between the magnification and the minification because we are used but to I'm pretty sure because people are going to come out with these devices. As we found that it gives you a, so much of a clarity and magnification and your surgery improves faster. So I'm pretty sure our training will also become much better with these systems. And most microscope in future will have this device attached. So and prices will definitely come down. And, and yes. I, I'll add that uh, over a period of time, the price is definitely going to come down. Uh, can I add one thing to the question about the angle? It's already answered. But one thing is that if you are right next to the microscope, the change in angle appears a lot. But when you move back, that angle becomes very small. And as Dr. Tial said, it is, it's only 7 to 10 degrees, which is not significant. It will appear significant if your eyes are at the microscope when you are looking at the monitor. Uh, one additional thing what I felt while doing surgeries in this system is that, you know, your recording is very good and, and very well centered and you can monitor that yourself and yeah. you don't have to depend on your assistant for monitoring that. Monitor. So that is also an additional advantage, which I felt uh, apart from so many good Other things. Than... Rajesh, I think quite uh, well uh, taken because the things are magnified. If, you, uh, if the patient is not uh, well centered, your uh, the, the clarity goes down. 
so you have to be centered almost every time so it is little more sensitive where your axis is little deviated in that way also you you are always going to do a coaxial surgery for your patients i do feel that when you do ocular surface surgery sir and i think i've shared this with you it is a little tricky because you have that whole wide field in front of you <laughs> and it's a little tricky as compared to when you would do it on a operating microscope which doesn't have a rt view system because you don't need that much everything yeah. you know kind of gets expanded for eye it is okay for intraocular surgeries it is fine for for your lamellar surgeries and all also probably it is fine but when you have to address the ocular surface then it kinds of gets massive shri ganesh can we have your talk please yeah uh, good evening dear friends and uh, thank you dr namrata and zais for inviting me to share some interesting cases with the artiboy 800 we got the artiboy 800 almost uh, one and a half years ago i was involved in the r and d of this microscope and uh, uh, we got the first installation actually the first global installation of uh, this microscope and uh, i've been using it ever since and i've got so used to it that i don't use the oculars anymore and uh, i think the previous uh, speakers have uh, covered the technology and the advantages uh, of this uh, system but i'll just show you some interesting cases which i did uh, this week and uh, let me just share my screen okay i am a consultant to carl zeiss meditech and uh, i'm all, all also uh, involved in the development of this uh, product and uh, like dr titiyal and grewal were discussing of course there are a few things you have to turn your head slightly to the side and uh, this is a higher end microscope uh, but uh, i'm sure in a couple of years you will be seeing something different coming up which uh, basically takes care of all these issues uh, and uh, of course i can't speak too much about it but uh, development is uh, underway so let me show you three cases that i did this week uh, the first case was uh, uh, an interesting case uh, i had operated this case as a patient of high myopia i had operated 11 years ago he came back with blurring of vision uh, since uh, two weeks and this was the condition the whole bag and uh, iul complex was just floating in the anterovitreous it was dislocated so i put in a trocar <coughs> cannula there and i decided to refixate this lens you can see it's a three piece lens it's an si40 lens and i'm refixating it with a modified yamane technique just through two 1mm side ports so this is interesting this is of course the artivo system you can see i'm just using 13% light and uh, i hold this i make the side ports i hold the lens and the bag and then carefully bring it into the anterior chamber you can see the clarity and the color the color of the conjunctival vessels the conjunctival vessels are focused the iris is focused um, so this is about uh, 7x magnification and uh, this again i am doing with the 3d system this is a complex case so it's not only for routine cases but complex cases also i bring the whole lens bag uh, complex into the anterior chamber you can see the somering ring there and uh, because of the high myopia uh, weak zonules this lens bag uh, complex are dislocated i do an anterior vitrectomy i remove the posterior capsule and then i'm with the vitrector uh, i'm basically chewing up the uh, somering ring there and after that uh, i kind of uh, separate the anterior capsule and uh, release it from the lens now i have to skin the capsule from the iul so that the iul is free so i take a sinski there and then i you can see that like uh, dr rajesh was saying it's always centered because you have to be centered when you're doing the microscope and the recording in hd is excellent so you can see very well your residents also can have the same view as a surgeon so i am just kind of releasing the capsule from the Uh, optic and also from the haptic there i i go there and then now i have released it and separating all around with the sinski
and you can see that now I've released that. This is a silicon lens you can make out from the shiny surface. This is an SI40. In very high myopes, I think uh, it was uh, plus two or something, the lens power. Very high myopes, you can have wigs on use over a period of time, you can. So I'm using this MST forceps to gently release this adherent capsule from the haptic because the haptic has to be clean. Otherwise you can't insert it into the needle for a MNA technique. So all these manoeuvres are done just through two side ports and you can see that uh, visualization is excellent. You're sitting up straight, you're looking at the screen and then you can even do all these small manoeuvres. So then I separate it. Now the other haptic has to be released. You have to kind of skin it from the other haptic, the capsular bag. It's quite adherent because it's almost 11 years since the first surgery was done. So I just kind of pull it and then skin it off and there it comes out. So the last part at the edge of the haptic, which uh, So you can see that uh, now the lens is free in the antechamber. I just remove the capsule. So then I go under the lens and do a vitrectomy, anterior vitrectomy to clear the vitreous there. Then I the pupil is small now. It's just a two and a half millimeter pupil. So I use an iris hook. And then I put the iris hook on the right side. And then I mark the diametrically opposite marks. I use a Mendes marker and then 1.7 millimeters diagonally away. I put the two marks where I have to pass the needle. This is a 27 gauge BD needle, which I bend. And then I pass it on the right side, trans conjunctival transcleral for about 1.5 millimeters and then enter. And you can see the needle has come under the iris. Then I go with through the other side port with the MST forceps, cannulated forceps, hold the haptic. The depth of uh, field is excellent and the visualization is excellent. So you can do all these maneuvers also, then pass it, railroad it through the 27 gauge needle there. Then I pull out the needle on one side and just leave it there. You can see that. I just leave the needle there. So, because I want to check the centration, because if you uh, flange it, then uh, if it's not well centered, again, you'll have a problem. I remove the iris hook there. And uh, I put it on the opposite side. I mean, on the other side port. Retract it. This is again so that you don't have to manipulate the haptic a lot because if you manipulate the haptic, it may twist or bend and then you don't get a proper alignment. Then I pass the 27 gauge needle. Again, go under the iris there. I'm able to see it very clearly because of the retracted iris. Go and hold the haptic with the MST forceps. And then it is a little tricky, but I thread it through the first time is a miss. Second time I get it in through the needle and then gently pull it. The pupil is small, so you have to be a little careful but the IOL again slips under the iris very easily now. I hold the haptic which has come out and with my left hand, I remove the iris hook. Because being ambidextrous kind of helps in these situations. Then I flange it with the 
thermal cautery. So you got a flange again there, nice flange. And you can see that the lens is very well centered. Then I go on to the other side, release it from the needle. Hold it. Actually, this patient was one eyed because the other eye, he has myopic degeneration and uh, a four wheel scar. So I wanted to do this minimally invasive technique. And again, flange it. You can have a nice flange there, adequate flange. And then you just bury it subconjunctively. And uh, that's basically the procedure where you have refixed, re refixated the IUL through two 1 mm side ports, minimally invasive. Uh, and then you can remove the trocar cannula. You can see the lens is very stable. Just hydrate the side ports a little and then I remove the trocar cannula, self-sealing and that's the procedure. This is the coaxial elimination, stereo coaxial. You can see that lens is very well centered. So that is the first case. And uh, the second case is a case of nanophthalmas. This was a patient who had uh, multiple angle closure attacks, uh, about seven millimeter axial length. Uh, you can see this posterior sinicae. So after giving mannitol and atropine for uh, three days, we gave atropine for three days, uh, free of mannitol. Here I'm doing uh, sclerotomies, two sclerotomies in first temporal and supra uh, temporal. And then um, I always like to do sclerotomies in such cases because you have a very high risk of uh, effusion. Uh, 50 odd years uh, old female, you can see you, I just incise with a diamond blade. The sclera is very thick, almost two millimeters. I go in with a Desmase punch and then punch it. So I have a nice opening. If at all there's a effusion, a choroidal effusion, then this takes care of it uh, to sclerotomies. You can make one or two sclerotomies. And then after that, you can proceed with the surgery. I make a side port, put in a viscoat here. I'm using a, you have to use a good viscoelastic, the AC, D is just 1.5 millimeters, so it's quite tricky. Then I have to release the sinicae. So there's a very high risk of choroidal effusion and malignant glaucoma. So you have to take precautions uh, to overcome these two issues. And uh, you can see that uh, because the depth is so good, though the AC is so flat, 1.5 millimeters, I'm able to see all the with all the clarity. And then this is the main entry. I make a slightly trapezoid incision because the lens is quite thick. It's a 48.5 adapter lens. And I use the malignant ring because these uh, irises typically are very floppy and then you can have a floppy iris, iris prolapsing, and then uh, you get into a fix. So uh, here I'm using the malignant ring. Actually, there's no space there. I just put the ring on the iris and then I'm manipulating it uh, to engage the pupil so that I have uh, adequately dilated pupil, which is not floppy. And you can see the cataract also is quite dense. So you have to use a good viscoelastic, uh, viscoelastic. And then um, I'm doing the capsular excess. Again, in these cases, the uh, anterior capsule is very convex. So I use a, a excess forceps rather than a needle. It's very difficult to do that excess with a needle. Aim for a, uh, 4.5 to 5 millimeter rexis, and that's the completion of the capsular rexis. And after that, uh, gentle, very gentle hydro dissection. See that the nucleus does not pop, otherwise, uh, a very little space there. And once then I make the other side port, and I go and you have to increase the IOP. Uh, here I'm using the Centurion, I increase IOP to 50 millimeters of mercury. And then uh, that's the FACO chop. And you have to do the surgery quickly because again, if you take more time, the risk of choroidal effusion, uh, expulsive again is uh, higher. There's an older patient again, uh, hypertensive, multiple angle closure, attacks, glaucoma. You can see that an iridectomy has already been done. So this is uh, management of the nucleus. 
chop and remove the fragments. That's the last fragment being removed. And always put in visco before withdrawing the probes. Maintain the chamber always. Otherwise, if the chamber collapses, even on uh, UBM, the patient had an anterior uh, rotated uh, ciliary body. You have a very high risk of uh, intrap malignant uh, glaucoma aqueous misdirection. So always maintain the chamber. That's the cortex being removed. Again, put in viscoelastic, remove. You can see this is a custom-made lens, 48.5 diopters from IOCare. Uh, so we put in the lens into the capsular bag. And you can see that once you put in the lens, I find that the, the capsule is very flaccid. And uh, I do a secondary capsular excess because uh, I don't want capsular contraction. Because once you remove that large nucleus, the eye is so small, definitely you'll have capsular phimosis. So that's the secondary capsular excess. And then I remove the malignant ring. And you can see that the chamber has uh, deepened very nicely. And then I go in with a vitrector. There's, I increase the size of the iridectomy. Then I do a zonulotomy and a hyaloidotomy. And uh, so that there is a connection between the posterior segment and anterior segment. This prevents the risk of malignant glaucoma. Again, malignant glaucoma risk is very high in these cases. So it is uh, one chamber there. And then I just hydrate the wound. You can suture the wound if you feel that it's not holding. That's the end of the procedure. I just uh, close the conjunctiva where I've done the sclerostomies. And uh, that was uh, management of nanophthalmos, and this patient is doing very well. We're following her up, I think her first day visual acuity was uh, uh, 6 by 18, uh, because these patients don't uh, improve fully. This is another interesting case which I did, uh, an ICL, and you can see that uh, I make a single incision for the ICL. This is a 2.8 mm incision with a diamond blade, intracambrial xylocaine. Then this is my cannula, which I used to inject viscoelastic. I'm using uh, sodium hyaluronate 1% there. And then I inject the lens into the anterior chamber. And again, you can see uh, the arteroid 14% illumination. You can see that the glow is so good, lateral illumination. I again, uh, I'm tucking the haptics through the main incision itself. I don't make side ports. This is the Ganesh ICL manipulator, which is available with uh, Epsilon. So you can even inject viscoelastic to maintain the chamber, deepen the chamber, and uh, the undersurface of this cannula is sandblasted. So you can, and it's got a curve. So you don't touch the central area of the lens and you tuck in the haptic. Once I'm done, okay, the ICL, is, so everything is going on well and everything looks okay. But then the RTO has the uh, IOCT. So after I remove the viscoelastic, I'm just aspirating the sodium arenate. It comes out as a bolus. It just takes about 15 seconds. You can aspirate it through the center flow hole there. And once that is done, then I just... Uh, I read the wound. Uh, okay, the case is almost over, but then I use my IOCT and then check the vault. And then you can see that uh, we have a surprise there. Okay. So end of the case, uh, fine, put on the IOCT now and uh, to check the vault. And you can see that uh, that's the IOCT, intrap OCT. Uh, the RTO 800 has IOCT and you have a large, you can see the vault is almost about 1,100 uh, microns. Uh, so you have a guide there also one millimeter. So each segment is 200 microns. So you have like 1,100 micron vault. So what do we do now? So you can see what I do is I go in with my cannula, irrigating cannula, and I just rotate the lens. This is a, a non-toric uh, ICL. So when you rotate it from horizontal to vertical, because the vertical sulcus is bigger than the horizontal sulcus. So I rotated it vertically. And then once you rotate it vertically, you can see what is happening to the vault. 
the vault reduces. And uh, you can see the vault has reduced to about 400 microns now, which is perfect. So from 1,100 microns to 400 microns. This is uh, how the RTO helps in uh, ICOs. Uh, so you don't have to bring back the patient, exchange the lens, or again, uh, rotate it. So having an IOCT uh, interop is very useful in such cases. So these were the three interesting cases which I did this week, which uh, I thought I would share with you all. Uh, RTO system is excellent. You can see at, even at almost 10x magnification, you have both uh, magnification and field, which you don't get with a regular operating microscope. You can see that the lens is focused, cornea is focused. You can see the blood vessels are focused. And uh, of course, all the other advantages that were uh, alluded by the other speakers. Thank you very much for your attention. If there are any questions, uh, we can take that. Thank you, Sri Ganesh. I think those were really a three sets of complex cases which you read. And uh, uh, intraoposity was there with the case with the ICL vault. And so if you had an intraoposity, otherwise also without having an RT view, that would help. But how do you think RT view particularly helped in the complex cases? Yeah, the, you can see that the visualization is better. So if you can see better, you do better. It's as if, why do we use an operating microscope? Because we want to see better. So with the RTO 800, you have better illumination, you have better magnification, you have both depth of field and magnification, which you don't get with the regular microscope. You don't have to keep refocusing, that saves you time. And uh, you can see even the uh, smallest details uh, very clearly. And uh, that actually helps your surgery. Of course, uh, longer surgeries, complex surgeries, uh, you're sitting up straight and looking at the screen uh, very ergonomic, uh, so you don't get any back pain or neck pain. Plus, these are cases where you have a lot of observers in the OT. All your fellows and residents uh, come, want to come and watch it. And so even if there are 10 of them, then they can wear the glasses and they have the same view as the surgeon. And it's an excellent uh, teaching tool. And uh, as you can see that the recording, you get very high quality recording. Um, and uh, you can see the small details. So it's uh, uh, and you're always uh, centered, like uh, Dr. Rajesh Sinha said, that uh, you don't have to keep uh, worrying whether you're you're centered or whether you've gone out of field. Uh, so that is, uh, you get excellent uh, videos uh, for teaching, and uh, you have 3D videos, you have 3D recording. So if you want to, if you have the facility to do a 3D relay or um, a 3D TV. Uh, then uh, it's uh, excellent to show others and teach others the smaller nuances of managing these uh, complex cases. These files are quite big. So how difficult or how easy it, is it to edit these? Uh, you, have to, you have to have a software which uh, compresses these files. Uh, and uh, then you can uh, uh, use that. So it is not a big issue, but uh, then you have a, a 2 TB or a 3 TB uh, hard drive where you uh, put in all your recording and you edit it uh, then and there so that you reduce the size. And then you put it. Of course, my, my surgeries don't need that much of editing. So <laughs> that's a good thing. It was almost an un all fever, almost unedited videos which <laughs> Uh, another thing is that cases like you have uh, Stephen Johnson syndrome, ocular surface problems, patients are not able to open their eyes there. You could, you know, decrease the illumination like Dr. Chitya yes. also showed. See, even otherwise, see, pain. even otherwise for topical cases. Or, yeah, for topical see, cases. See, topical FACO when you're especially, doing, if you... Especially refractive surgery where patient yeah. sees everything. Yeah. It's not a white cataract, but patient actually sees the entire light going into his eyes. So ICLs, basically all the light is going into the eye. So they're very sensitive. When you use a regular microscope, you have to use 25-30% illumination and they're squeezing against the speculum. Here you can just use 10% illumination. They're very comfortable. And you also have good visualization. And even topical uh, FACO is much more comfortable for patients. Plus you have all the other uh, assistance that you need for capsulorexis, the Z align for toric alignment, uh, for LRIs, you have the markings. Uh, so these are all additional. Uh, and the other thing I find is for patients who have uh, severe uh, kyphosis, who cannot lie down, those who have uh, breathing issues, uh, then uh, sometimes you may have to stand and operate. And uh, that's when this helps because you're totally dissociated from the oculars. 
So you can just stand, watch the screen and operate. And I have done so many cases like this. It's very comfortable for the surgeon, comfortable for the patient. And uh, that is uh, where uh, in such cases, it kind of uh, really makes a difference. And you can kind of stand and operate. And uh, irrespective of uh, the surgeon's height, some of them are tall, some of them are short. Uh, and sometimes it becomes very difficult to adjust the microscope uh, because they, they have to sit up and then the table is hitting their legs here because you're dissociated from the oculars. The microscope can be at any height. And uh, so you can make yourself comfortable with what, look at the screen. Even shorter surgeons are very comfortable using it. And you don't have to adjust the IPD every time. So basically no surgeon settings like that. Plus you have the EQ workplace and the Callisto where you can transfer all the data seamlessly from IOL Master 700. You can do put in your post-operative fractions. You can get your uh, nomograms and your personalized day constant. So the whole host of other uh, uh, technologies associated with uh, the RTO 800, which uh, helps you in your practice. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sri Ganesh. I now would invite the next speaker, uh, Dr. Ishtak Anwar from Bangladesh, who is going to be speaking about RTU 800, the digital microscope, our initial experience. Uh, thank you and good evening, Professor Namrata Sharma and uh, Professor Rajesh Sinha. And uh, I also like to thank AIOS and ZEISS uh, for arranging this, such a nice webinar. Uh, is my, uh, am I visible? Perfect, perfect. Everything is fine. Thank you. Um, so we have got this uh, very recently and we were eagerly waiting to use it. And uh, as with new technology, this is just a journey. And this was a very good journey for us. We were waiting for it for a long time. And uh, for any technology, it goes through adaptation. And uh, what used to happen is that we used to get all these uh, technologies once they were tested in the Western countries. We used to get it after many years, third generation or fourth generation, and we used to get all the benefits. But now uh, scenario is changing and we nearly order at the same time. So we are also uh, going through the evolution and contributing to science. So why we wanted this microscope. As Professor Sri Ganesh says is that, you know, what you see better, you can operate better. So viewing, one thing is that we wanted to see is clarity, the ergonomics that we were all talking regarding how we had to sit straight with our uh, back straight and uh, our eyes fixed to the oculars for a prolonged time causing neck and back pain the beautiful magnification that it goes up to and uh, i think we've lost audio from uh, dr anwar is the audio on no, ma'am. No, audio is off. Now, the, Dr. Anwar, can you repeat? Dr. Anwar, can you write it on the chat, Sudhil, that uh, there Hello? is some problem with the audio? Am now, I audible? Yeah, yeah, now you are audible. OK. So better depth perception and uh, all the informations uh, that we has used to have in Callisto, like what the illumination, the magnification, what mode we were using. And this is an excellent technique teaching tool. So all the OR staff and the fellows can see whatever we are doing. So our experience, we had a big expectation. And when I saw first, it was just wow, that such big images that we can see with such clarity. But with time, we had to adjust some of the OR settings and how, how we were doing our operations. So this is a big screen, 55 inch monitor, and uh, there is possible to go with huge magnification. It looks so big, the eye, and the illumination, as uh, the previous speakers has said, that it can be as low as 5% of what we used to do. 
like here what we can see that the magnification is nearly 20 times still there is no distortion of image and the depth perception is very nice so the learning curve when we were getting it every surgeon of our hospital was very eager to know that how it's going to be how hard it's going to be adapt and uh, we had a live surgery just three days after we got it and uh, i had the opportunity to do one of the live surgeries so i did uh, just two surgeries before that day and uh, it was not that problematic i could do a live surgery with a normal speed and the other things were that where to set the monitor, how to sit, how much to tilt the head. All these things, I think, with uh, three to five surgeries, it is possible to get idea and get accustomed to that. So the learning curve, I would say that it's not that much. And as the previous speakers have said that we can do surgery in very low light. So there is less chance of phototoxicity, especially when the uh, trainees are doing, they tend to take more time. The patient comfort is much more and uh, nearly it can be done at one third of the light what we were used to do. The magnification is enhanced. The depth perception is not that much affected when we magnify it. And the resolution, as it has been mentioned, that is a 4K quality beautiful resolution. I would like to just share two surgeries. And, uh, we can see that uh, the magnification and all the add-ons here, how much illumination I was initially using a little bit more illumination. So this is a uh, lens I intended to do was a bag in the lens. So once the anterior capsular axis was done, we have to do the posterior capsular axis. And we can see beautifully even the wrinkling of the posterior capsular axis. The so neck is made with a lateral movement. And then with OVD, that is enlarged. And the OVD is pushed into the burger space, separating the posterior capsule. And all this was visible so beautifully. Then a posterior capsular axis was made, you know, in the similar size of that of the anterior capsular axis. Just for the sake of time, I would just uh, go a little faster. This is edited. Once the posterior capsular axis was made, this is a special lens, Bill Iwell, which was invented by Professor Mare Joseph Tazignan. So we put both the capsular axis rim in the groove of the eye well. And we can see both the anterior capsular axis, posterior capsular axis, everything so clearly and look at all the surroundings. And even up to 25%, 20 times magnification, it was so nice. And uh, as uh, Professor Titel was saying that in PCT or other cases like this, this was one of my colleagues was doing this case where he intended to put a toric eye well and there was a posterior capsule rupture. So I took over and converted that rupture into a PCC. So this was a toric eye well intended What I would like to say that the magnification is 10 times, illumination is 45%. I could see the anterior capsular axis, posterior capsular axis, and place the lens in between those two. And as Professor Titiwal was saying that we have a beautiful three lines which guides us where to put and place the intended axis. So just dial it and put them in that axis. So you can see that anterior capsular axis and the posterior capsule rent margin so nicely. It's so clear and uh, visible even with that magnification. 
so when we got it there was some apprehension regarding the latency but uh, as discussed earlier it's only 50 micro second which is uh, nothing that our brain can detect so it's seamlessly we can go along with normal thing and the other thing is that there is uh, something that zeiss is calling hybrid mode that we can put the ocular at any moment if we are not comfortable and we feel that we need to use it it's very easy it does not take much of time it takes only 30 seconds you have to just screw it and we can use both the ocular and the monitor is also there so all the or stuff can see whatever we are seeing through the ocular but there are some little adjustment we had to make as um, most of the surgeons now operate temporarily so for a right eye and left eye the screen needs to be constantly moved and rotated and uh, we can't view exactly straight ahead which we are uh, we are doing till now so this needs to be uh, adjusted and we have to tilt little bit to the right or left according to the eye and uh, i was uh, i was trying to go close to the microscope but um, uh, i think uh, as uh, professor uh, sri ganesh said that if we lean back little bit this would not create problem so this was a good uh, tip for me i'm going to try the next day so this is the thing what i felt that lot of movement of the monitor was needed once i was going from left to right side and there was so many wires thick wires and um, at times i felt this could be an issue with the sterilization it can touch the trolley or something so for maintaining an optical optimal viewing adequate distance is required it say that 5 to 6 feet so we have to have a big ot for this if there is a small ot and somebody operates um, then this can be a point and uh, most of the uh, cataract surgeons as uh, nowadays does under topical anesthesia there is lot of eye movement continuously and drifting of the head little bit from side to side and so it requires frequent recentration because what i felt that uh, the view when the eye is at center is best and uh, there is little margin of error uh, with the, like uh, it's not same as that uh, conventional microscope so you have to be exactly at the center to get the best view the other thing the first uh, surgery that i did what we used to do is we used to fix up the microscope first and then set the table so here i did that and the table went so low so this was the understanding for me that first we have to set the table height at my hands level and then set the microscope height because i don't have to put it in alignment with my eyes so in conclusion i would like to say that the learning curve is not that long takes usually 3 to 5 cases to get accustomed to all the change dynamics and position and uh, we did not observe any significant lag time but what all the speakers are saying that there needs to be little uh, less movement with the fine focus but uh, in our center what most of the uh, surgeons are feeling that we have to focus uh, you know more rather than the conventional microscope and uh, in future what we would expect is that the monitor should be wireless so that uh, you know when we are moving we don't have to take all that wires and movement of the monitor can be minimized in some way and one other thing that for any technologies to sustain the cost is a big issue so i'm sure in future this is going to come down the best thing is that all the or staff fellows are on board they are seeing whatever i am seeing and uh, we have like 36 surgeons and all of the surgeons have tried it and uh, all of them are just uh, excited to use it and they are doing very well so what i request that we can sit back and rest our back thank you thank you uh... Dr. Anwar, it was a nice uh, talk and very nicely presented your experience. 
we uh, now move on to our next speaker and we have uh, dr narain shetty who will be uh, giving his talk on the topic that is uh, toric iol workflow with eq for optimal efficiency dr narain shetty please thank you sir uh, on the onset i would like to thank aios and zeiss for giving me this opportunity so today i'll be talking about eq workflow for a toric patient so all of us keep thriving to be efficient uh, to save time and indirectly save cost too but what is efficiency efficiency is doing better what is already being done so what is already being done is we have been using all manual markers but the errors happen because of uh, there's no reference point as uh, errors happen because of head tilt cycle torsion or sometimes when you excessively wash the cornea then the markings go as you all know every 1 degree of misalignment of toric lens we lose about 3% of its corrective effect so when we use the routine three step technique of marking the toric uh, of marking the eye uh, first uh, that is uh, first we mark the eye uh, uh, horizontally uh, on the slit lamp then intraoperatively we mark uh, 0180 on the eye and then the also the marking of the desired uh, axis of alignment of the toric lens so when we use this technique with the bubble marker we have found that the mean error of axis is about 2.8 i mean 2.48 and also the total error in toric iol alignment is about 4.98 so is there something better this is where the callisto comes in so basically it is a markerless system uh, what it does is it gives an intraoperative reference point for you to align your uh, lens but it has other features also it compensates for the cycle torsion and gives you the right axis where you can uh, create your incisions your lris and also do your capsular excess perfectly centered to the pupil or the uh, or the limbus and also it helps you in the toric alignment so uh, as you can see i i uh, instill i mean i put a ctr in all my toric patients uh, as you can see i am doing it under irrigation so once i have put the cap uh, ctr the trailing part i hold it with a micro forceps and put it into the bag that way i'm rest assured it doesn't go into the sulcus now why ctr as you can see uh, there's a huge gap uh, between the posterior capsule and the lens and the optic this is one of the reasons why there is a higher chance of uh, rotation during the early post operative period now when we implant the ctr what happens is it uh, expand the bag and brings the anterior cap posterior capsule closer together uh, thus increasing the contact between the optic and the bag as you can see this is a post ctr implanted eye where you can see a beautiful contact between the posterior capsule and the lens it also has an automated tracking so you, even if the patient moves its eye the alignment or the reference points keep moving along with it so this is how the uh, ole uh, looks like where you just have to align the uh, toric lens uh, according to the mark now when we compare marker and markerless system definitely i think in terms of uh, quantity of vision as the tithi also said rightly said the quantity is similar but definitely there is a significant uh, increase in quality of vision uh, especially if you're going for a toric multifocal or trifocal lens the patients will uh, appreciate the difference between the two and there are different studies stating the same so now we have good hands and good machines is that enough no we need to connect them and this should be a seamless connection this is where the zeiss eq uh, workplace 1.6 comes into play basically what it does is it uh, seamlessly connects all the different machines in your hospital and brings it into one place uh, and it uses a, a platform called as forum and connects all the uh, all the plan so in 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 the clinic so what we do is once we do the biometry uh, the iol uh, iol master data gets uh, uh, transferred into the online uh, and not just the biometric data uh, also the topography the oct uh, the any any dicom uh, machines you can use it and upload it online and this can be accessed from any computer from anywhere now the first thing what you do is you need to log in and you need to customize your settings that means first you can uh, choose the formulas which you normally use and also the iols which you normally use and also the order quantity and also the mail emails you want to send your order to so uh, once you have done this you don't need to keep repeating it uh, and uh, it will make sure that it follows the same routine now uh, coming to iol selection uh, so once you have uh, 
uh, selected the IOL, you just have to add the IOL and uh, then you go ahead and then just go for the IOL order. Check everything and just press IOL order and you're done and you're good to go. You can also do your surgical planning. Uh, you can align your, I mean, where the lens should be aligned, your uh, incisions uh, and everything. And this you can transfer to your OT. Now, by chance, you are not able to do it uh, during your work time. Uh, let's say you have a long drive from your work to home. You can do it on your app on your phone. Uh, and while you're driving, you can just simply update all the uh, data and do all the changes that needs to be done. Now, in the OT, when you select the lens uh, to confirm it is the right lens, you can use the same app. Uh, once you scan it, uh, scan it from your phone. And uh, that way, you will make sure that you're not implanting the wrong lens, as you can see in the image here. So post-surgery, uh, one of the very unique features, you can personalize your IOL constant sitting at home or sitting at your workplace. So for any IOL for in your hands, what is the most optimum A, uh, the IOL, uh, the, uh, A constant? You can really uh, customize it when you add the pre-op and post-op data and also uh, put, in, put in the post-op refraction. And that way you can really customize and tighten your uh, post-op results. Now, does all of this actually improve efficiency or is it just a gimmick? So we did a study where we looked at the time taken before and after EQ workplace. So this is how the workflow normally goes before the work, uh, workplace, I mean, before EQ workplace in the macular system where the, all the scans are done, the printouts are taken, the, the usually the calculations done by the fellows or the junior surgeons and it is given to the concerned surgeon. Now, if the surgeon's busy, it might, uh, you know, it might take even 30 minutes to, you know, reach for him and get him signatures. And then maybe, uh, you know, it goes to the store department and purchase order. So the time taken might range from uh, 8 minutes, 30 seconds to 62 minutes, 30 seconds. Now, after the EQ workplace and the macular system, so the time taken is just about 55 seconds to 1 minute, uh, 22 seconds. Now, let's look at the int uh, intraoperative uh, workflow. As you can see, this is how the normal workflow uh, goes on. Not much of changes, but the place where we actually save time is during the marking and also during the surgery, uh, the marking what you save is about 30 seconds and then seven minutes during the marking. So total of about seven and a half minutes in the intraoperative period you save. But uh, we have about, we do usually do about 100 uh, surgeries per day. So that means we save about 750 minutes which is a significant time which we save. And especially when your OTs are really busy, this will really uh, impact uh, your efficiency and make sure that uh, you're doing, uh, giving a good experience for your patients. Now let's get into the patient's shoes. As, we, uh, as you all know, or uh, we all want a patient workflow. We don't want a patient workflow to be long and inefficient. We want a, a patient workflow to be short and sweet. So uh, likewise, uh, so when we look at the patient workflow for a toric patient without EQ, place, uh, EQ uh, workplace and macular system, first you have to install a local anesthesia eye drops when you're working on the strip lamp. And this is not just once, you again have to apply it once more during your surgery. As you all know, the local anesthesia is pretty toxic to the epithelium and the more you apply, it'll damage the epithelium and you have punctate epithelial erosion, even though you're, uh, you've done a perfect surgery. Because of this, the patients will have a lot of discomfort, redness, watering, uh, and also decreased vision on the day of surgery. But when we look at the patient uh, workflow or a toric patient with EQ workplace and a macular system, there is absolutely no added step uh, when you compare from a monofocal uh, patient. You'd just be the same. And on the day of surgery, patient's so much more comfortable. He's so happy. His vision also is much better. So I'd like to conclude by saying, uh, we need to be efficient, not just at work, uh, even in everything uh, we do, even the smallest thing like brushing or even when you're wearing your clothes, keep thinking on the most efficient way of doing. That way, uh, you're rest assured, no matter what you do, you're doing your best. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Naren, again, uh, for a very nice presentation. Uh, there is a question for Dr. Sri Ganesh, and that is uh, the case in which the nanothalmos case, uh, there's a question on YouTube channel that do you think a lot of manipulation was done in that case and will the angle get damaged? 
Uh, no, the, the patient, nanoftalmus patient already had uh, multiple angle closure uh, attacks and then had uh, also a PI done, had extensive uh, posture sinicae. Uh, we released the posture sinicae, put in the malignant ring. There was not much of uh, manipulation at the angle. And uh, you put in a heavy viscoelastic like viscoat at the angle, deep in the chamber, sometimes it stretches the trabecular me meshwork also, improves the outflow. And uh, of course, I still have to see this. Uh, I just saw the first day post-op, corneas were clear. Uh, there was not much of reaction. And I put the patient on uh, steroids, uh, oral steroids, which uh, has to be done in nanophthalmos because it reduces the incidence of uh, uh, choroidal effusion. So I put I put the patient on 40 milligrams uh, oral steroids for a week, and then we'll taper it off. And uh, these are the precautions, pre-op, atropine, mannitol, and then oral steroids. But uh, the patient was doing very well. Like I said, patient had 618 uh, uncorrected vision, and we'll have to see uh, corneas were clear. And, uh, we called her after a week to, again, check uh, IOPs. But uh, should be OK. She was already on uh, anti-glaucoma medication. Uh, uh, two drops, so we'll have to see whether it reduces. Thank you, Shri Ganesh. There is one question which Dr. Ishtak, I think one issue which he raised, and he said that there's a problem for the right eye and left eye, and I would require, I would request Dr. Chityal sir to say that, you know, what he does since he has such a high volume of cases, right eye and left eye, and if you have only one machine, or do you actually require two machines, so you place one for the right eye and one for the left eye? I think uh, in future we'll require two uh, systems. But what I do, I start with a one set of eyes. So first finish the left eye, then shift to right eye. In that way, you can manage the timing better. But he's right. In the beginning, uh, I also had a you know, little bit of adjustment, uh, right and left eye, with the screen is you know, uh, slightly different for le left and right eye. But as you keep operating, the things become very, very simple. You don't doesn't hamper your thinking also. I think so it, it has a thick wire, uh, maybe. Level. Maybe wireless system, if it comes, it, it may be more useful. Yes, sir. No, no, that, okay. I think Siri Guinness can tell us. Yeah, okay. I, I, do not, see, I do not have any problem because what I do is I have uh, uh, tables which get pushed in. So uh, I am sitting, uh, my position is fixed. I don't change my foot pedals. I don't change anything. The table comes in uh, for the uh, right eyes. It comes in from the right. For the left eyes, it comes in from the left. So there is no issue at all. And then the cable is uh, taken in the periphery of the room. And then I have the television uh, there. So the uh, cable does not obstruct the television. You cannot have wireless because uh, uh, the wireless transmission is not uh, good enough to relay the uh, very TV and yeah. HD uh, relay. So you, you need to have wires. And then it is, again, uh, limited to, I think, about uh, 15 feet. You can't have very long wires also because that will, again, give rise to lag. So these are all issues uh, that we went through while uh, developing it. But uh, regarding the uh, tilt, of course, that will be taken care of the different system, uh, basically, which uh, does not have ocular. So you can look over the microscope. So Dr. Varan, like I agree. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I agree with uh, Sri Ganesh. I'm using the same system where the patient is wheeled in. And after every surgery, it is not the patient changing, it's the trolley coming in. And the position is the, I, I picked it up from Signature only the position of the microscope and the machine of the, and the RT were remain the same. The trolleys are placed at an angle for right eye like this and left eye like this. So there's no issue in, and we don't differentiate between right and left eye as the list is coming. So there's no issue in that. Narayan, you wanted to say something? Yeah, yes, ma'am. So actually, I was about to tell the same that uh, see, I, I, if uh, if you have a small OT or big OT, actually, if you do plan it properly, it is possible to you know move the tables or the beds in such a way that you don't need to move too much. Uh, maximum you can even if it is in a small OT, you can just uh, you just have to tilt the screen. That's all. That's the max you need to do in a small OT for a right and left time. Um, I would say uh, the immediate solution, I think for now, like everyone is saying, you know, uh, wireless system and all, I think the, the simplest solution, if at all, you really can't operate and it's moving a lot, you want, want to think of a solution, I think to have one more screen, not a full RTO, just have one more screen on the other side. And that way you can, you know, just simply uh, keep looking there and operating. You don't need to shift any 
uh, wires. But, but, but splitting the lights won't uh, affect the quality of uh, uh, it's, image. Uh, it's not splitting the light, sir. It's only splitting the uh, taking the output, sir. In the sense, uh, in the, from the wire, we will have two outputs, which will be going to one screen and this. So simultaneously, both screens will be viewed. So you just need to uh, move yourself and see which screen you need to see. I mean, that's the... But the, but the screen is very expensive. So yeah. It's, it's very, a medi medical so, grade monitor and uh, it's pretty uh, expensive. So that's the... I think the MI, MI system, MI TVs, I think... Uh, <laughs> <we need that. laughs> but, but it's quite efficient. And once you get used to it, if you have these rotating tables, I do 15, 16 surgeries an hour. And it's very efficient. Uh, not a problem. 15, 16 surgeries an hour. So, Ganesha, if I can ask you a question. Uh... <coughs> Sir? Yes. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So, actually, wonderful surgery, sir. I mean, it's really nice to see your skills every time. Uh, I was just wondering for the first case, sir, uh, uh, yeah. any particular reason why you didn't uh, take the whole uh, complex out and then uh, place it in? I mean, any particular reason to. Why, why did you have to, you know, de skin it first? Skin it and all. Uh, <laughs> and then, you know, uh, put. Yeah. yeah. See, see, the thing is, uh, you have to make an incision. Incision, and then, uh, A larger incision, remove the whole uh, uh, bag with the lens and then use a new lens. So instead of doing that, this is minimally invasive, just two side ports, one mm side ports, you can manage to do the whole surgery. You just need to remove the capsule, capsular bag from the IOL so that the IOL is left behind. And uh, that can be done easily. And then you do a vitrectomy and you, you can see the fixation is quite easy. So 15 minutes, you can finish the surgery. The other option is if you can just strip the later part of the haptic and leave the capsule which is enveloping the, uh, you know, margin of the optics. So you can leave that and maybe strip the half of. No, but there was a there was a somering ring also. You could see that. Yeah, that so that you had removed that. by vitrector, no. Yeah. After. Otherwise, what happens is that kind of drops into the vitreous or it floats into the anterior chamber, iritis, secondary glaucoma, all those problems. So you need to do a thorough job. You remove everything. You don't need the capsule there. You don't need the remnants there. You just want the IUL. It was a three-piece IUL. If it's not a three-piece IUL, then definitely mm -hmm. you have to kind of explant it and then put in a three-piece IUL. But this was a SI-40, a three-piece IUL. And uh, it saves cost to the patient also. No, what I meant was that you can remove the summoning ring, but if the capsule is just around the optic and a little bit on the haptic, then maybe capsule around the optic is not going to cause any reaction. That's what I meant. Because yeah, chipping, but, but, yeah. but you have removed the posterior part, right? So if the anterior yeah. part slips, later on comes into the anterior chamber, it's going to rub against the iris. So <laughs> yeah, it's, it's actually quite easy to remove it. So I yeah. just showed the technique of how it can be done with a Sinsky, you can just strip it off. Yeah, I think uh, we've had a very useful discussion. It was like a, uh, uh, you know, meeting on uh, RT view and uh, digitization of the entire cataract surgery that is going to happen in future with all the uh, gadgets. And uh, we would like to thank all the speakers for sparing out their time and for being with us, for showing excellent presentations. Particularly, we would like to thank our international speaker from Bangladesh, Dr. Ishtak Anwar, for being with us today. Uh, and uh, also like to thank my co-moderator, Dr. Rajesh Sena, uh, Professor Tritial for going through the whole gamut of the thing, Dr. Shri Ganesh for showing us such excellent cases, Dr. Grewal, sir. I think he is the first person to adopt any new technology that comes and we all learn from him. And then Dr. Narayan Shetty for an excellent presentation in the end to show us how everything gets integrated. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Zayas, for doing this. And we this is our third in the series of the uh, digitization of the operating microscopes, which we've uh, finished today. And uh, we started with the posterior segment, and then today was the anterior segment. And in between, we had both anterior and posterior segment. So thank you, Zayas. Thank you, all the speakers. And uh, we had, uh, although this is such a uh, uh, such an advanced subject, and not everybody can buy this, but still we had a lot of uh, viewers on the YouTube as well as on the Facebook. Uh, and thank you, all the people who watched us. Uh, and thank you, the audiovisual team. Mr. Sunil, Kripal Rana, and Rakhi at the back who manage this day in and day out. So thank you, everyone. And hope to see you on another platform next time in a webinar.
Thank you. Thank you. Everyone. Good night. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Good night. Good night.